welcome to another episode of Unstoppable Mindset. Today we get to talk to Katherine Johnson, and she will tell you that one of the things that she gets to do is turning obstacles into joy. And, you know, you can't get any better than that. So I'm not going to give her any more of an introduction than that, except I expect this to be a good, fun interview. And that's what we want to do here at Unstoppable Mindset is have fun anyway. So with that in mind, Catherine, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Michael. I'm so happy to be with you today. Looking forward to chatting with your listeners. Well, I appreciate that. And yeah, they're, they're as much a part of this as anything. So I appreciate all the background that you gave me to help me prepare. And at the same time, um, you taking the time to do this. So let's start this way. I love to start this way. Tell me a little about you growing up and sort of your, your earlier years before we get into everything that's going on today. Well, my earlier years actually set the stage for where I am today. Um, I had the interesting experience of being born with something called cerebral palsy. And that is a, a neuromuscular disability that causes difficulty, in my case, with walking and coordination. And so I actually view that as my greatest gift because it's shaped my perspective of everything I do, shaped my perspective of the world. Um, I've realized that simply being alive is a privilege because sometimes people, you know, they don't make it as much as to live as many years as I have. And being able to move, freedom to move is also a privilege. There's a lot of people that aren't as able as I am. So I see very much as a privilege rather than what I've lost. So you, you grew up with cerebral palsy. Do you walk at all or do you use I walk, a wheelchair or what? No, I walk with two walking canes. And um, when I am at home, I don't use my canes at all. I just, I basically use my canes for being outside of my home. More and stability, I'm, better balance. Yes. And, you know, there aren't, there aren't things like walls and stuff like that that you can hang on to. Yeah. Inside. So, so I need some support, but otherwise I'm self-sufficient at home and I just find it easier because I have full use of my hands that way. So. Well, you know, that's as good as it gets. So if, uh, do you have any children? No, I don't. Just I was going to say, if you did, so you got your hands, you can beat them up and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, whatever it takes. I don't, and I mean that facetiously, of course, but still, um, that is great. So you grew up with cerebral palsy. Yes, I did. And I did. so how did that affect you in school? What was it like going to school and, and being definitely in a minority from that standpoint? Were oh, you for sure. And all that? For sure. I'm going to date myself a little bit. Um, I started school right at the end of the end of, I think, what they called segregation or the beginning of mainstreaming, which means they used to, they used to send people like me, quote unquote, to special school with people right. with disabilities. What, and, what, year, what year was that? What year was that? I started kindergarten in 1978. Okay. So, yeah, by the time I was in first grade, that was 1980. And it was just, they were just starting to realize that maybe we can put these kids with, with the normal kids. <laughs> yeah, the whole yeah. concept of normal. So, yeah. so you were, you were mainstreamed as it were. Yes. And how did that all work out for you? Oh, you know, I feel as an adult now, looking back, I feel bad for my teachers. Um, they had no idea what to do. And, you know, the truth is they didn't need to do anything. They just needed to treat me like anybody else, because fortunately, cognitively, I'm just as smart as my peers, if not towards the top end of my class. Um, 
but they just thought, what are we going to do? Like, it was always a question of what are we going to do with Catherine? Cause she's different. And I I've spent my whole life, I think, um, with this message of whoever I talk to that, you know, you, you really don't need to do much differently. If I, if I would like help, I will ask you directly because I know my limitations. Um, so if you, if I don't ask, don't worry about it. I've got this handled. I've dealt with this my whole life. Um, I find that people see me, I walk into a room and the first thing they think is, how can we help? And it comes from a place of having a good heart, but also a lack of awareness that somehow um, maybe like things are hard. And I don't, I don't think that things are hard. Things are just different. Cause like I said, I'm used to this dealing with this every day, all day, 24 seven, I don't get a day off. So, <laughs> so um, I got it handled. Um, the best thing to do for me personally is if you want to help me, ask me how I need help, because often people tend to just kind of take over and think they know what I need. And then, and then we end up kind of literally tripping over each other and it becomes this awkward mess of how to help Catherine. And I just, I just want to be with people, you know, just yeah. be with me, just get to know me and be with me and learn all the interesting things there is to get, get to know me. Cause there's really a lot of things that I've accomplished. As school progressed, did, did life in a sense, get any easier? Did, did teachers improve at all? The more they got to see you um, and see that, gee, maybe it isn't really as bad as we thought. Absolutely. And I think, I think there's two reasons for that. I think one society changed over time, thank goodness. And I think also, you know, um, I matured, so I was able to communicate better and people got to know me over time. So, um, they just learned, they learned my observation that, you know, all this worrying we've been doing about Catherine really is not an issue. I remember in the 10th grade in high school, the, 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 so this is in the nineties, early nineties. Um, the teachers had this great idea that I needed a escort from, from, you know, grade 12 to help me, um, get from the front door to where the bus picked me up at the end of the parking lot. Because what if I fell, what if I fell on the ice in the winter time? And I thought, for goodness sake, <laughs> I'm 15 years old. Are you serious? But, you know, it just my request to be left to my own independence fell on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. Until one day, my buddy, my bus buddy was walking along with me on the ice and she slipped and I didn't. And that was the end of that. And they left me to my own devices after that. So where were you going to school, by the way, geographically? Um, I went to school in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is okay. north of North Dakota. So I right. see teachers are um, a definite thing. We've got snow from November to February, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Do you live there now or where do you live now? No, now I'm very fortunate to live in beautiful British Columbia on the, on the West coast. Less snow. Almost no snow. However, we do have snow today. It's snowing today. Yeah, we, um, I live South of you in Victorville, California. I don't think we'll get snow. We live in a Valley. So mm -hmm. the snow usually goes over us, but places around us get snow. We won't, but we'll be getting rain later this week. So that's fine. Oh, good for you, California. <laughs> rain. We live up in the mountains and it, and it is true. You can go from the beach to skiing in a couple of hours and we're closer to the skiing than the beach, but still um, it's nice and, and we enjoy it. Well, that's great that you're living in British Columbia. Yes, much better and a little bit more climate friendly place to be. Yes, it is. I move for a lot of reasons. I like that the city is uh, 
things are closer together than in in the uh, the west the western provinces of Canada, and it's just easier to to get where I need to go. So that's why I moved. So you went to high school, and eventually they they left you alone a little bit more and left you to your own devices. Yeah. Um, did you ever slip in the snow or on the ice? Oh, sure. But I got up. I mean, you know, people, people, that's what people say. What if you fall? What if you fall? And I say, well, I'll get up. (laughs) And to me, it's such an obvious answer because what am I going to do? Sit like sit there and and cry about it. You know, no, I'm going to get up because I know how to fall so that I don't, I don't hurt myself. You know, I don't do it dangerously And I just, I know, I also know how to get up because they don't let you, therapists don't let you leave, um, don't let, don't let you go home with a pair of crutches unless you know how to get up from them. (laughs) They will not let you go home. So, so you are, you are well prepared when you leave with your walking aids to use them in all aspects. Well, you just said something very interesting too. You know how to fall, yeah. which of course, a lot of people don't really learn how to do. And so they are more apt to hurt themselves than somebody who truly knows how to fall when something happens. That's true. My experience is, you know, if I, when I start to fight gravity, that's when I hurt myself. When I just yeah. go with it, I'm not really falling. My knees are touching the ground, but I'm not really falling. Right. And it's, you know, I, I've hurt, I've gotten hurt more often because people try to catch me than, than if I just let gravity do its thing. It's, yeah. it's so, it's very interesting. And that's an interesting way to put it, that you get hurt more when people try to help because they don't know how to help. And we're not doing enough to educate people. We just assume that disability means lack of ability. And that's not what disability means at all. It's a characteristic. And we need to somehow educate the public that the reality is you should learn what to do. And the best way to learn is to ask us. Yes. And everybody's different. So, you know, I, I know it works for me and I, I always talk about my experience and then I say, you know, in general, ask the person because I don't know what it's like for everybody on crutches. I just know what it's like for me on crutches. Yep. Well, so you left high school after graduating and all that. And then what did you do? Well, then I decided to enroll in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Manitoba. I, the plan was to get a Bachelor of Social Work. Um, but and you needed a, a year of a year of university. So I s- decided to study psychology. And then I didn't get into the Faculty of Social Work, so I decided to study another year of psychology. Um, I even applied out of province. And, you know, year three, I I tried two years to get in um, to the Faculty of Social Work, and that that didn't happen. So in year three, I finished my 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 arts degree with a major in psychology and a minor in sociology. And um, that was, that was interesting, but it was like, okay, now what? Because an arts degree doesn't qualify you to do a lot of things in the world of work. So I took a year off and it was kind of like, now what? And I was training competitively for track and field at that time. Uh, at that point in my life, I was was racing competitively uh, in wheelchair racing. I raced um, anything from 100 meters to 800 meters. And I've also done some, some half marathons, I think, some road races. Um, so I took a year off and I went actually to Vancouver to train with the national team for a few months. Um, 
in night and then uh that summer i went to germany to represent team canada now was that in paralympics or regular non-para olympics that was what you would consider para olympics okay okay adaptive sports but still the, the bottom line is you did it and you ran that's right well in in a wheelchair yes in a racing wheelchair oh okay yes all right so you um so you went and competed and and i ended up with two bronze medals in the 100 and 200 meters for team canada yay yay and then i realized something very interesting why am i doing this <laughs> <laughs> because at that time I had I started racing when I was 12 or 13. At this time I was now 20. And I I, you know, it's the it literally you're going in circles, racing around a track, going in circles. <laughs> and it was a lot of work. And I just thought, you know, I just I've got all these medals. And I'm never going to be satisfied because I'm always going to be able to get faster. So I left the sport after I competed in Germany because I felt like life was calling me to different things. And? And after that, what did I do? Well, I went into, um, I went into business school, community college. One of the best things I ever did. Um, I took um, business, majored in, ac in accounting. And um, my teacher said, gosh, Catherine, you're so good at accounting. You should really finish. Finish your accounting. Get a professional accounting designation. Mm. And I thought, my goodness, more school? Like this is now five years of post-secondary education. More school? And so, yes, I did finish and I ended up with a professional accounting designation. Um, and then. And, and so know, what degrees did you have by this time? By this time, I had a Bachelor of Arts major in psychology, a business administration diploma and a CPA, which is a chartered professional accountant in with a Canadian designation. Now, your first degree, the Bachelor's of Arts degree, you said you got in three years. Is that normal? That is normal. That was the last year they offered a three-year program. It's now four. It's now four. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you now have three degrees. You have become a person very knowledgeable in accounting. And what did you do with that? Well, I finally started working. <laughs> Good thing to start at some point anyway. It, yeah. Well, I had summer jobs and, and different things along the way, but, you know, I finally started in the, in the world of work, full-time work in accounting, accounting, being an accounting clerk and working my way up. And, you know, along the way, I worked for a lot of small businesses and I tend to be very efficient at what I do because, you know, having a disability, you're, I have pride, pride myself on being efficient because there are certain things I do, they, they take longer. So I need to be more efficient at what I do, right? To be equal to others. And so what this did is gave me a very unique skill in that I was allowed, I would, it allowed me to see ways I could make companies more efficient, which was wonderful. I tended to save them tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, streamlining their processes and um, making everything more efficient and making the company more profitable and the employees happier. And in the process, <laughs> I got to experience um, six layoffs in 20 years. Oh, boy. Just because... Wow, you took the job from a job and a half when you you know you're you're doing your job and you're working overtime over much so much because you're buried in in inefficiency and uh, a pile of paper to oh we only need 
you half time. And I was like, well, I don't want to work half time. I want to work full time. So I, I left and I moved on and I found something else. <clears throat> and that happened six times in a row. So there's a, there's a message there somewhere. There is a message there somewhere. <laughs> the sixth layoff and the final layoff was in 2017. Um, I chose, I chose a layoff package in 2017 for several reasons. The company was going through a restructure and I was feeling like my work at my company um, as good as it was, I wasn't making the impact in the world I wanted to make. And I just thought, you know, I, I, I need to do something else. So I took a layoff package and I went to California for six months, right? It sounds cliche, but I honestly, that's what I did. I went to California for six months to unwind, took the train from, from Vancouver all the way down to the Bay area, had a lot of fun with uh, some friends I have there and took a bunch of personal growth retreats. I'd been studying personal growth since 2009. And my very last retreat that I was at in um, October of 2017, it was a small meditation group of 10 people. And they all said one thing. They said, Catherine, you're brilliant. You got to write a book. And I thought, me write a book I'm an accountant I don't know how to write a book and you know but everybody said it and they really meant it I could tell and and so I I went home and I thought about it for a while and um because I thought what am I going to do with my life you know and I thought okay if I write this book it will change my life. I just know that. I know that in my heart. And I thought, well, do I really want it? And the answer was absolutely yes. Because at the end of my life, I absolutely did not want somebody to show me, look what you could have had if you chose to be uncomfortable for a little while. Look at the impact. But you said, no, 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 I'll stay in my comfort zone. That's okay. I'll stay in my numbers and my comfort zone and my steady paycheck. I, I, The thought of that just made me sick. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write this book. And in January 8, 2018, I started to write a book called The Joy of Obstacles. And I thought, what am I going to write about? And I thought, well, write what you know, which is my life. And so my book is is um, a self-help memoir that takes readers from birth to present day and different milestones in my life, different experiences. Each chapter has questions where the reader can um, look at their own life and take the principles from the book and apply them to their own life to help them move through obstacles. <laughs> Essentially, my message is this. We all have obstacles as a vehicle for learning and growth. And there's always good in the obstacle, even though just keep looking for that good because there's something there's something there that's good. You're growing, you're learning, you're connecting with other people. Most importantly, you're connecting with other people. If we had all the answers, we wouldn't need other people as much. We wouldn't need creativity. We wouldn't need all these things. And the world would stagnate. So really, obstacles exist to help us learning, learn and grow and connect and be a better version of ourselves. Through being a better version of ourselves, everybody wins. So it's our job to embrace those obstacles that we're given and connect and look for the good and help each other grow. When we reach out to, to overcome our obstacles, we grow because we've overcome what we're struggling with, but also the person helping us grows. Now, I want to just tie that back to something I said earlier about people trying to help me and it made it a little different, a little difficult. So in that case, I would say the lesson is 
for me to be communicating in a way that I don't necessarily um, communicate in a way so that my needs are heard. And the lesson for the other person is to understand me on a different level and broaden their perspective about who I am and uh, what I'm able to do and look at me in a different way. The other side of talking about the fact that we all face obstacles is that we also all have gifts and we need to recognize how to use our gifts and we need to learn to use our gifts. And those, of course, gifts that we have can help us deal with the obstacles that are put in our path because the obstacles that are put in our path are there because of whatever and whoever we are, right? That's right. And so it's all about learning to use the gifts that you're given. What do you think your greatest gift is? Gift is? Well, I think... I think honestly being born with cerebral palsy was my greatest gift and is my greatest gift because it, it shapes, it shapes my perspective of everything because I don't get a day off. As I said, I don't get a day off from this. I don't have good days and bad days. It just is. I, it's impossible for me to live life without it. And I realized like, I've I've learned all these skills. I've learned to be resilient. I've learned to be an excellent listener because when you maybe don't move like other people, you need to rely on your other senses. And for me, it's listening and speaking as opposed to maybe running away from a difficult situation, <laughs> right? Um, right? Also, I've learned to be a very good problem solver in terms of how am I going to get from A to B? How am I going to navigate the situation in life? Um, I understand, you know, I, I'm very resourceful. I'm very efficient. I know how to, I'm organized. My time is very well organized. I look at people who can drive and have two legs that work like most people. And I, I, I think about how they they run their day and I think, my goodness, how do you get anything done? You're going, you're going back and forth and up and up and back and inside out. And like, I would have that done in half the time. But do you because, drive at all? Um, actually, I do not. I rely on public transit and I'm, I'm okay with that. That's one of the reasons I moved to Vancouver because their transit system is. Yeah. The transit um, system up there is really good. I didn't know whether you by any chance drove and used hand controls. No, I do not. I choose not to. I find it easier just to take the bus. That's, yeah. I'm fine with that. Well, in my opinion, it'll be high time when autonomous vehicles really are perfected and we can take driving out of the hands of drivers because they certainly don't do it very well. Well, that's what I've heard. You know, it'll be interesting. <laughs> It'll be interesting when we have those autonomous driving cars. I, I well, wonder what that will be like. You never know. Uh, I, um, I've i been in many cars and I listen to the people who are driving grumble about this person cut me off or this person wasn't watching. This person is doing whatever. So um, I figure that there's there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to drive. And I think that the Department of Motor Vehicles is very prejudiced, not allowing a blind person to drive, because I think we can probably drive just as well as anybody else the way I keep hearing people drive. I don't see a problem. Well, we'll <laughs> see. We'll see what happens with that one, Michael. I know. No, the, the time will come when we really get to, and I, I'm serious, take the hand, take the driving out of the hands of drivers because too many people take it way too much for granted. They're not really looking at it seriously. And as you said, they, they're often very disorganized and frazzled in, in what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm fine with taking transit or taking a taxi. It's either way it works. It saves me a lot of money. <laughs> It does. It does. In the long run, it'll save you a lot of money. We don't have really good public transit here, um, but I've been on the 
transit systems up in Vancouver. So I know how good they are and how well you can get around up there using them. When I lived in Boston for a while and in Massachusetts, Boston has good public transit too, which really worked out well for me. That's good. You know what I've noticed lately, Michael, in Vancouver is they're, they're starting to put braille on the bus, the sign for the bus, and they put it at sort of arm height so that you can know what bus is going to stop at the stop. So does it change as buses are coming? Well, it's, it's Braille, so. Um, well, um, what I'm getting at is that oftentimes the signs that are available show you what bus is coming, what the next one is or whatever. But they don't do that in, in Braille. They could, but that's a pretty expensive process. Yeah, they don't. They don't. We also have d digital signs. Um, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Some some stops have digital signs. The SkyTrain has digital signs. Um, the newer line has um, voice as well. So it tells you what stop it um, you're at and um, which train is coming and all of that. Yeah. Right. Well, so for you, having been born with cerebral palsy and and I can appreciate you saying that that's really your greatest gift. And we could talk about disabilities and how they are our greatest gifts. And there's a lot of merit to that for the reasons that you said, what is your disability taught you specifically? Never give up or at least never give up. If you want to do something <laughs> like if you really want to do something, never give up because there's a way. You know, there comes a time in life, and I talk about this in my book, there comes a time in life when maybe it's time to move on. And, and that's a separate issue with a separate um, decision-making process. But if you have some, if, if somebody has the passion and the desire to do something, do not give up because if you have the passion, it's yours to have. And there's a way there's a way you'll figure it out. You'll be connected with the people to help you. Um, you'll find the resources, you know, often people in life, they say, well, I'd love to have this in my life, but here I am at point A and I can only see these certain things in this box. And what I, what I coach people to do is what would you absolutely love? Start there and then take a step because as you take a step from a hundred percent of what you want, this vision of a hundred percent of what you want, your perspective will change. Just like you're walking down the street when, as you walk, you see different houses or you are aware of different things in your environment. But if you don't move, you don't see different options. So start with 100% of what you would love in your life and take one step at a time. And eventually, you'll find your way. There's a big difference between being stubborn and being passionate, just being stubborn. I'm going to do this regardless, which may or may not be something that you will be able to do. And it doesn't necessarily reflect the passion of being able to do it. You're just going to do it because. But if you're truly passionate, there's a whole lot more of yourself that goes into it. And as you said, you start by really envisioning what you want and you will figure out how to get there because it's what you really want to do as opposed to just being stubborn about doing. That's right. And I've been both. <laughs> we all have. I've definitely had my stubborn moments in life, which have served me. You know, they've served me at the time. I think in a way they've served me. How so? Um, I, it just, yeah, it's just this idea of like, I'm not going to let what someone else thinks stop me just because someone else is older, bigger, stronger, and different and tells me they know because they don't know if there's something in my 
beingness that is guiding me to do something, I'm going to do it. And nobody can tell me otherwise, even Mm -hmm. if it seems crazy to them that I can get something done. I know I can. And that's all that matters. So what it's taught me is don't worry so much about what other people think. Let me ask you this. Um, You said something earlier about having experienced six layoffs. Do you think that your last layoff, for example, you said the company was restructuring and so on. Did any of that come about because of the things that you did to make them more efficient and they had to change the way they were doing things? Um, gosh, that's, that sounds like such a, it's like a, another lifetime ago. I, um, yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, it certainly didn't hurt. Yeah, it certainly didn't hurt. That's a good way of putting it. I know that the majority of the other layoffs were because of efficiency, because of the efficiencies that I created. Uh huh. Well, so you, you've been through a number of changes. Yes. Then you just start, decided to start writing a book. Did you publish it yourself or did you find a publisher to help you or how did that all work out? It's, it's self-published on Amazon. Okay. It's available um, in ebook, print, and Audible. Um, it was very important to me to have an audio book because I know not everybody can use their hands and in this case, not even be able to, you know, read text. So I wanted to have, I wanted to have um, an audio book for people who learn differently by verbal information. Did you I'm write, a- did you read it? No, no. I hired, um, I hired a voice a voice, um, what do you call them? Well, I heard an some or an, a reader. A voice. Um, she's a voice actress. Uh-huh. Beautiful job. Very, very happy with what she did. Yeah. That's because great. again, it's not my strength. A lot of people told said, Oh, it's a self-help book. You should record it. It would be better if it's your voice, you know. And I thought, you know. It's not that it's not as easy as people think to record a book. Like really, I respect that there is finesse involved and that is not something that I have. Um, at least not in, in terms of writing, of reading an entire book. And I'm so glad that I that I hired it out because I know people who started publishing their print book at the same time I did. Their print book is long published. Their audio book is yet to be um, yet to be uh, published. So it's still you know in the studio, <laughs> and that's too bad. It's too bad. Yeah, yeah, um, and. Everyone has gifts, as I said before, and yours may very well not be in the reading of the book. Um, I think that it is it is very possible for most all of us to learn to tell stories and to communicate with people, but reading a book is a whole different art form, and so that that may very well not be what you should do, and that's something that only you can decide, and nobody should second guess that, so I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. When I when my first book Thunderdog was published, people said, "Are you going to record it?" And I said, "No," because I think there are people who could do a much better job than I. And the publisher of Thunderdog, Thomas Nelson Publishing, contracted with Oasis Audio when Christopher Prince, an actor out here in Los Angeles, actually read the book and did a wonderful job with it. Yeah, it was it was certainly um, a go- a great investment, I think. Yeah, but yeah. it's good that it was at least put into uh, into an audio format. It's on Audible and all that. So um, I I hear exactly what you're saying. However, and she loved my book. You know what she said? She said your book came to me just at the perfect time, Catherine. So it helped isn't, her. Isn't that the way of it? A lot of times that happens. Yeah. Are you a religious person? 
No, I'm not a religious person. I am a spiritual person, though. Um, so I don't necessarily believe in any strict dogma, but I do believe in things like divine timing and I would say a divine intelligence. Okay. Things. And, and that is that is as good as it gets. Um, and I, I agree with you. We all get guidance and um, there is that inner voice that talks to all of us if we would but learn to listen to it. That's right. That's right. Well, you talked a lot about obstacles and uh, dealing with obstacles. What do you think the, the most port- important thing is in facing obstacles? What's kind of the, the most important key to facing an obstacle that you can tell us about? We always have a choice of how we respond. So remember, um, things don't happen to you. That's, I think that's a, that's a key for people to remember is, is life doesn't happen to you. Things happen. Events are neutral. We may not like them. Believe me, I've had my share of doozies. Um, But things are neutral and they're there for our good, for our growth. How we, how we choose to view them is up to us. You know, they've done studies with twins that grow up in in not so pleasant environments. One of them ends up being incredibly successful. And they said, well, why? And they said, well, because of the tough environment I grew up in, I wanted to be the exact opposite. And they went off and they got to be incredibly successful, whatever that meant for them. The other twin ended up basically repeating the cycle, whatever that cycle was. And so it's all a matter of perception and like, what am I going to do with what I'm faced with? It's not the thing, it's how we respond to that thing. And that's 100% within our control. Um, If you need help, you know, there's coaches out there. I coach people on how to overcome their obstacles. So um, I'm here for you if you're looking for some support. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So you wrote a book. Yes. And when you were writing the book, is that all you did? Or you got laid off and you had to, I would assume, figure out a way to get some sort of income. What did you do? What did I do? Um, Well, I've been... I have been building my business ever since and relying on um, on my resources that I've accumulated up to that point. So tell us about that. So you decided to start your own business and exactly what is the business? The business is I, I'm, a, I'm a coach, speaker, author. So I have my book, The Joy of Obstacles. I have um, a workbook that goes with it. I also have a second book called 21 Simple Solutions to Take You from Surviving to Thriving, which is just as it says, 21 uh, quick one-page tips. And then it's a journal that you can apply those tips to your life and steps to implement them on a weekly basis. Um, I do speaking all over, um, virtual speaking mostly at this time. Um, based in Vancouver. And I'm also a coach. So I coach a system that was taught to me by Mary Morrissey. And um, like I said, I I help people build a vision and then give them support for, for creating a life that is in their heart and that they would absolutely love. I'm also intuitive. So I do things like um, intuitive card readings or tarot readings. I do mediumship readings and I do a process called ancestral clearing, which is great to help people overcome obstacles because um, what that does is it's all about what you feel in your body. I don't need to know your history. A lot of people say, oh, I don't want to talk about it. It's too difficult. I don't need to know. All I need to know is my shoulder hurts or my knee hurts or ooh i have a funny feeling in the pit of my stomach or whatever and i can work with that 
So, you know, if you've got some pattern that you'd like to um, resolve, you can book an appointment with me. All my appointments are virtual. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. I can help you. You can do readings virtually. Yes, I can. Yeah, I can. How did you get to be a coach? I decided. <laughs> there you go. I've got, I've got 15 years. I've been studying personal growth since, since 2009. So, so what happened is I, um, I finished accounting school in 2002 and then, you know, almost immediately I started to study esoteric, um, spiritual things, consciousness, why are we here? All of those big questions and then when I moved to Vancouver, um, you know, personal growth is big out here as it is in California as well. And I just got really involved with, with this whole movement of being the best person you can be. And I thought that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's not about, it's not about, for me, it's not about, you know, going to school, getting a job saving your money so you re can retire in golf. I mean, that's just, that's, that's great if that's what you want. But for me, that wasn't the point. There was a bigger picture. And, and I just, so I just kept studying. And the more I studied, the more I loved it. So now after 15 years, I decided to coach it. Do you have to get a license or a certification to be a coach? Um, I am certified. I did take a, a, a correspondence course. Um, however, coaching at this point is a profession that you do not need a certification. It's not, it's not a nationally standard, standardized profession. But there is still a process behind it. Um, there is a process behind it. Yeah, they vary depending on uh, which which um, school you you take your training through. I took mine through correspondence. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. What comes to mind as you're talking about all the various aspects of things here is that we spend so much time focusing on a lot of stuff and the real focusing of ourselves on a lot of stuff is all about, we think we have to control it or we want to control it. And we never really learn to recognize what we really have control over and what we don't have control over, which gets back to your whole issue about choice, right? And that in reality, we should learn to focus on what we can control and leave the rest alone. And we all just seem to have a hard time doing that, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, myself included. And I think that that comes from fear, which is false evidence appearing real. It's the stories we make up in our head. You know, they get the best of us, sometimes myself included. And so, you know, Get information, obviously, the more information you have, the uh, more likely those little fear gremlins will uh, calm down. But also, you know, trust your heart. Trust your heart. I believe your heart is like your compass. That's your guiding light of what's what is right for you or what's your path or you know, what's your next move? And often it doesn't, it doesn't always make sense. You know, why would somebody with a successful accounting career after 20 years, give it all up? Why would somebody do that? And yeah. basically because it felt like the right thing to do. And there's something calling me that says, I want to make a bigger impact in the world. And I think that this is a better way for me to do it versus sitting and dealing with, you know, accounting numbers all day. I want to be talking to people and um, helping people directly. Tell me your acronym again for fear. False evidence appearing real. There you go. And it is something that we 
all deal with a lot. And we, again, it gets back to want to control. And you're right. A lot of it is based on fear. We're actually writing a new book that is a little way away from being publishing published. We have a, a publisher for it. And our working title is a guide dog's guide to being brave because I've worked with eight guide dogs over the years, oh. but we were writing it to talk about fear and to try to help people overcome what I call being blinded by fear because things happen to us. We don't expect oh. them to happen. We've been conditioned to be afraid of, those things that happen to us that are unexpected. And I suppose you could say there's some natural reaction that causes some of that. But at the same time, we can learn to let real fear be a positive influence and force in our lives rather than letting it overwhelm us. And so we're writing a book about that. And it'll be a lot of fun when we're done with it. We've got our first draft done and hopefully it will be going to the publisher soon. And that will be fun. But fear is oftentimes false evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was Mark Twain who said, I've had lots of fears and most of them don't ever come true. That's right. We worry, again, myself included, worry about things. And 95% of them are never going to happen. Focus on what you want, not what you're afraid of. (laughs) And just take one step at a time. One step, just a small step, makes a huge difference. Well, for you, having come to the place where you are in the world, what do you feel your purpose or your mission is in life today? My mission is to move the world together through embracing obstacles and helping people find their joy. We're stronger together than we are separately. And as I've said throughout this interview, obstacles are here for us to learn and grow, not just the person with the obstacle, but the person helping the person with the obstacle. And all of us, you know, are meant to live our best life. That I think is our sort of our personal mission as humans on this collective earth. Um, Deepak Chopra describes it as we all have we, we're all pieces in a puzzle. And if we're not living our best life, we're in the wrong place in the puzzle and the other pieces don't fit together. So we all have the possible, we all have the responsibility to live our best life and be, be the best version of ourselves, be in the right place in our puzzle. Other people around us will then move into their right place and the world will be so much better for everybody. And it's all about, you know, trusting our hearts. People are so um, caught up. And I think this is collectively we're caught up in doing what is our normal. You know, we sort of were born into circumstances and we just go from one thing to another because that's what we do and we're comfortable and we don't know what else to do. So I'll just keep doing what I always do. But is it really, is it, does it really feel right? Are we really happy or are we just comfortable? And I think, you know, especially now with all the changes in the world, people are really starting to wake up and say, you know, there's something, there's something out there for me that is just more impactful than what I'm doing. This is great. I've learned a lot from this aspect of my life, but it doesn't, it doesn't feed me. It doesn't feed me. It, I, you know, there's something different that's calling me. I don't know what it is, but boy, I, just there's something else where my time is better spent and people are starting to search. And so those that's those are the people that I want to draw into my community and we can help each other overcome our obstacles and be the better version, the best version of ourselves. Yeah, we we oftentimes do find that we just want to stay in our comfort zone and that is great. That's okay. It's nice to be comfortable, but if we don't learn to grow, we never will grow. 
And it is something that all too often people just don't want to do. I'm, I'm always fascinated when I hear that one of the top five fears that people have is public speaking. And it's been considered the number one fear a lot of the time. Yeah. And I, I kind of think why, because people are afraid, oh, they're going to be criticized or they're going to be laughed at, or they, they put all sorts of obstacles in their way, but that's mm-hmm. the key, right? They're putting the obstacles in their way. That's they're right. not even real obstacles, but the reality is that, we talk to people all the time. We all communicate. We don't have a problem doing that. And so why should it be any different if you're actually going to go out and be a public speaker? Because what you're going to be doing is saying essentially, hopefully the same things to now a much bigger audience. And probably if people come to hear you speak, they want to hear what you have to say. And that's really pretty good. That's really powerful. Um, would you believe it that I was probably the kid in the class who was the worst at public speaking? And, That's hard to imagine. And now I'm sitting here on the radio with you, Michael. We're having a great time. We are. And it's it's not all that hard to do if we allow ourselves to grow and stretch. And there are things that we can use to learn to speak well. Did you do anything like go to Toastmasters or any of those sorts of things? Or how did you learn to become a a good speaker? Um, I got some mentoring. I, I did honestly go to, to Toastmasters. I didn't stay very long because I feel like the type of speaking I do uh, is not really what Toastmasters teaches. Toastmasters is more of a business speaking organization. What I did realize, though, is is what I'm good at with speaking. So it gave me some, some awareness that way. I think it's shifted some from that. I, I haven't heard many people today really say it's all about business speaking because it's really about speaking. And whether it's business or something else, it's still about learning to communicate. And there's a lot of opportunity to get more information. I didn't do a lot with Toastmasters, although I've done some. But I think that for me, probably, I love to tell this, that for me, the biggest way that I learned to be a public speaker was when I was growing up and I had to take spelling tests in school. The teacher would hand out, well, everybody had their pencils and papers and the teacher would say the words and everyone had to write the words on papers and then you exchange them. And then the teacher would write the words on the board so that you could grade the spelling, except when it was my class, because I wasn't going to be grading papers and I wasn't going to be writing the words because I didn't know how to to write well enough to do that. So the result was I had to spell the words in front of the class. I remember missing one once, but the bottom line is I worked at not missing so that I could spell the words correctly and that people could rely on me to spell them appropriately. So I usually got an A in spelling. My wife would, would say today, you do a lot better with spell checker, but still it's all about learning. And um, I think that helped me a lot not to be afraid to be in front of an audience. So I've kind of always rejected the concept that we have to be afraid of public speaking. We don't need to be. That's true. That's absolutely true. Just, and again, it goes back to, um, you know, like your obstacle was not being able to write. So you had to speak. So there you go. How an obstacle actually gave you a strength that is probably better than average. Right. So Well, and, and in a lot of ways, because it also, when I was learning to teach, I took um, courses and teaching from the Irvine School, UC Irvine School of Education. And one of the things that I did was not write on the board for my classes. I would get a volunteer every day to write on the board. And it got to the point where everyone wanted to be the board writer that day. So it helped me engage with the classes and establish a relationship with them, which was also a good thing. And it also meant that I was facing the class, talking with the class and not staring at the board, writing something down. And I've been in classes where 
all the professors ever did was just write on the board all day and never understood why students didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to what they did. Well, isn't that interesting? Thanks for sharing, Michael. That's interesting. Yeah, that's great. So what makes your coaching program unique and something that people should want to partake of? Well, my my coaching program is unique in that it focuses on both the practical side or the right brain and the intuitive or left brain side. So um, as we've been talking today, we've talked about how I'm very organized and I'm going to getting from A to B and problem solving and all that. So my coaching program helps people navigate life in that way. But it, it's also, um, it helps people connect with their intuition and I help them connect with their hearts, with their, um, with their passions and their higher selves so that they can use their, their inner guidance to guide them on their path. And I do readings as well as for part of my coaching. Well, if people would like to reach out to you and, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So it's both, both sides, both that intuitive side and, and your practical side. That's what you get with me. Well, if people want to reach out to you and learn about your program, learn about the coaching and uh, perhaps get a reading, perhaps learn a lot of the skills and tools that you have to offer people, how do they do that? They can reach out to me on my website, inspiredbycatherine.com. Catherine is K-A-T-H-R-Y-N.com. And you can send me a message. There's, you know, there's courses. Everything's on the shop page. So inspiredbycatherine.com slash shop. That will take you directly to all the wonderful things I have. Um, I'd love to hear from anybody. I have a wide variety of services to help you no matter where you're at. So if you're looking for support, please reach out. I know, I know I have at least something that could help you. So I'd love to say hello and help you on your way and connect and say hi. I can't resist saying that you and I met through Potapalooza. We've talked about Potapalooza on this podcast often. What brought you to Potapalooza? My, uh, my marketing consultant is connected with, um, with the group somehow. And she said, Hey, Catherine, you might want to try this event. What do you think? And so I signed up. So did you go to be interviewed or did you go because you might start your own podcast or have you started your own podcast or uh, any of that kind of thing? No, I don't have my own podcast as yet. I've been to Podapalooza. I've done two events and I'm registered for the January one as well. Yeah, as, as am I. So I think that will be a lot of fun to do. Well, Catherine, thanks again for being here and so talking much. with us. And I hope everyone really appreciates all that you've offered. You've offered some great insights and great lessons. And as I said, I think that the most important thing that you and I, and we've shown it a lot here today, the most important thing we can say is disability does not mean lack of ability and that people need to grow and recognize that we have talents too. We are just as capable as you. We may not do exactly things in the same way that you do, but it doesn't mean that we can't do them. So I hope people will reach out. I hope people will come and talk with you and learn and become better than they are. I hope so too. I just love to help people. And it it hurts my heart to see people struggling unnecessarily. So um, if I've said anything at all, if you have any questions for me, I, I'd love to just, you know, have a chit chat and, and answer some questions. I offer a free 30 minute discovery call for anyone who is just looking for information, no obligation. You can book it straight from my website, inspiredbycatherine.com. Perfect. Well, all of you, please reach out to Catherine. Hope that you'll do that. I would really appreciate it if 
after listening to this, you would write me personally. I'd love to know what you thought of the podcast. Please give us a five-star rating. If you'd like to write me, please email michaelhi at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com, or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. But please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate it. I really would love to hear your comments and your thoughts. And if you know of anyone who might be a good guest for Unstoppable Mindset, and hopefully some of you have listened to a lot of these, and so you've got a pretty good idea of what we do, love to hear from you with any suggestions of people who we ought to have on the podcast. And Catherine, that goes for you as well. If you can think of anyone, love to have your thoughts and suggestions about others to have on the podcast. I sure will. I sure but, will. And I'm, I'm meeting a lot of people. So I'll keep you in mind, Michael. This was a great time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate you coming on. And once more, thank you for being here with us. You're welcome. You're welcome.